So um, I'll come, we'll start by um, asking um, how um, Clapboard Jungle came to be. Uh, toward the beginning of 2014, I was trying to figure out a project that I could make uh, on the zero budget that I basically had, like whatever extra money I had, spending money or um, you know earnings from my post-production company or whatever. I knew it would be a while before I was able to get the budget together for something bigger. Uh, and six months ago, I had just released Skull World, which was my previous documentary, which mm -hmm. I, I know you've seen. Um, so I figured I might as well make another documentary. And I was trying to come up with ideas that I could effectively make given the access that I have uh, for no budget uh, and, and how I can just spend like a couple of thousand dollars on some cheap camera here and just start producing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's kind of the genesis for, for how it came about was I was just looking to figure out a project I could self-generate and self-produce. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it just kind of blew out of proportion <laughs> to some degree over the years as I collected like, I don't know, 120 interviews and like <laughs> 100 hours of raw footage. It just, it just ballooned. But it all started from that like, I'm going to pay it out of my own pocket. I'm going to do it as almost like a hobby um, on the side of everything else. And I figured that well, this one's perfect because as I'm going to markets and as I'm trying to get my projects going, I could be also simultaneously shooting that uh, opportunistically, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, so were you uneasy about uh, making a documentary that focused primarily on yourself? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to put it mildly, I was, I was very uneasy. Um, Part of it was just because I knew that if, if it was going to be any good at all, it couldn't be any kind of a vanity project to any degree. And, and knowing even going into it, being self-aware of the fact that it doesn't matter how many, however many steps I take mm -hmm. to distance myself, I'm, I'm way too close to my subject. Mm -hmm. So I, I knew going into it, it, in order for it to actually mean anything and be a valuable project for someone, I, I would have to be incredibly honest mm -hmm. as much as I possibly could be. I would have to put myself out there in a vulnerable kind of way and just roll with at things as they happen, the way they happen, instead of embellishing or making myself look like, you know, I've got my shit together all the time, which I don't. So I, I figured that, A, I need to have other sets of eyes on it from early on. So I brought on Daryl Shaw as my co-producer because uh, he was able to be there to call me on my shit. I uh, mm -hmm. hope I can swear. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, he was there early on to call me on my shit. And then as we were starting to cut it together, bringing on Kevin Burke and the, um, and even early on, I had like Ali Chappelle and uh, Chris Alexander on board as associate producers helping just people throughout the pro process to help get interviews, uh, but also give feedback and distance mm -hmm. um, and to, to just make sure that I'm delivering something that isn't so self-serving that it loses all value as a piece of, art and as a piece of uh, educational asset, I guess. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, yeah. it was, it was nerve wracking. And even now it's like the reviews of this film, you know, there are a couple negative ones, which mm -hmm. is good. That's actually a really good average for me. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of positive, but um, I know that the reviews of this film, because I'm the subject are also sort of reviews as me as a person. So it's kind of like here, that's this thing I made. It's also my life. So if you, yeah. you know, if you call me in a review, I'm an, like, I'm annoying or something like that. It's like, well, I guess I am to that person. So it's, it's, it's a little nerve wracking and anxiety causing, but I did it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how that well, turns out. No. Well, for one thing I wanted to bring up is that the, the kind of like early snag for Clapboard Jungle when you did the um, Indiegogo campaign, but only made 25% of the go, for yeah. I was one of those. <laughs> yeah, you were. And then Thanks. just... Um, what do you think this says about how uh, viable crowdfunding is for um, filmmakers? I mean, crowdfunding seems to work for a lot of people. It didn't really work for us. Um, a, a good example, you can compare two documentaries that are both out roughly around the same time is uh, In Search of Darkness and Clapboard Jungle. So In Search of Darkness raised, what, half a million bucks? And, but their idea was much more general to, hey, do you like horror movies? Well, guess what? We're going to talk specifically about horror movies and you're going to be reminded of all these movies you grew up loving and it's easy to throw 20 bucks at that. It's like, yeah, sure. I wouldn't mind seeing like a behind the music style clip movie of all these like and have the people who created like that's a very concise topic for a vast amount of people. So something like that on crowdfunding documentary wise does pretty well because it's, it's not in, as niche as this. And this one is very much like I think there's a couple of reasons this one failed. Oh, three, I would say. And one of them was that you have to treat crowdfunding like it's a full-time job when you're doing it. And if you're not, and you, and I was working and doing a pile of other things and I didn't have like a big team around the crowdfunding campaign. I had Daryl and you know a couple other people. 
I wasn't able to put a ton of focus in just getting it out there and pushing it all the time, all the time. Um, so it didn't do well on that level. I think another thing is this is a niche project. It's a, it's a, it's something that's made specifically for, uh, or initially at least how it would have looked into when we did that campaign specifically for people who want to be filmmakers, which is a big group of people, but they're largely broke and they're <laughs> like, and they're, and they're largely, uh, I mean, not all of them, but a lot of them. And, and, um, and there, there's a thousand products out there like that, where it's like, you know, we're going to teach you how to be a filmmaker or, you know, the Dove Simmons film school or things like, you know, there's all these little masterclass, you know, there's lots of other options and lots of other competition. So I'm not sure that my message was as clear back then as to how this would be different. Uh Um, And, and third was just, we were, we were so early in the project that it was like, we didn't have really a clear I don't think we had a concise message as to what we were actually getting out there. And it, yeah, it, it's tough. I think crowdfunding works for some, it doesn't work for others. And it, it, it's anybody's guess sometimes as to why that is. We were even like partnered directly with Indiegogo on that campaign. Like we were front paged and I, I approached them a month ahead of the campaign and they were actually a partner on the campaign itself. And we still only raised a quarter of our, of our goal, mm-hmm. which, you know, slows a lot of things down. It was probably yeah. for the better in the long run. Mm-hmm. And we are still going to, you know, every every perk somebody bought, they are going to get. It just took a long time to get there. Yeah. Uh, well, I think I, I got like the one perk of your like your previous documentaries a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would have still haven't still haven't yeah. watched the but the the Rockstar one. Now, or the Rockstar. Yeah. Well, that's I have know. it on I have it on like like my Vimeo watch list for like five years. <laughs> yeah, but it's also on like Amazon Prime now too, so yeah. you can just go and watch it however we want. For some reason, that movie performs incredibly well on Amazon Prime, more than mm-hmm. almost anything I've gotten. I have no idea why. So um, were there anyone you wanted to interview for the film that you were unable to? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I reached out to a ton of people and not everybody said yes. And a lot of people, um, I live in Toronto and in order to get interviews with somebody, I would need to be where they are. And a lot of the people I was reaching out to were in LA or New York or France or somewhere else. And I was going to those places, but only for short periods of time. So I, I just to line up a, like a good example is Gail Ann Hurd. I reached out to Gail Ann Hurd because I thought, you know, she'd be an incredible, the, the history she has as a producer in the, in the business. Um, I did, I didn't really have any, uh, any legacy producers who've been producing that long uh, from, from the, the, the women's perspective in the movie. Um, you know, I had Anne Mary Jellius and a few people, but I, I was, I really wanted that perspective. Um, but I was only going to be in LA for five days and she was dealing with either the walking dead or something else. And it was like, there was no way we were going to get lined up for a, for an interview. Uh, I mean, John Carpenter, uh, David Cronenberg. I tried, I tried those people. Uh, I tried, I tried really hard to get more uh, POC representation and things like that. Uh, I tried Ernest Dickerson. I tried lots of people. It was just so many scheduling conflicts. It was really tough. I'm just, but I'm very happy. I got who I did. I mean, I can't complain. So was it kind of like um, serendipitous that the film eventually kind of like turned into your goal to get Life Changer made? Sort of. I mean, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> you could probably do a metal, meta analysis of how that all came together and how it reflects within the actual film I was making first. And uh, you, you could probably try and do mental gymnastics about that till the cows come home. Uh, I think ultimately... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, frankly, I didn't know, I started shooting this, I had no idea if I'd have a, an arc or an ending. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had no idea if my career was even going to grow over this period of time, and that would be a very, a much more depressing documentary, <laughs> ultimately. Um, or, or at least it wouldn't, it wouldn't have that sort of rocky arc to it, kind of like the buildup of, okay, things are going better, things are going better, oh, this happened, and then we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what the future holds, that kind of arc to the story. I had no idea that would be there. So I kind of started making this on faith that there would be something interesting to show and it's debatable whether or not it is. Um, that's up to the individual person watching it. But I will say that uh, I, I definitely very thankful that um, I was able to make things happen the way they did. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know how else to put it. I mean, I'm thankful that life went in the way it did. I, that doesn't mean there weren't hardships along the way. And that doesn't mean there don't still consider you to be plenty of hardships, <laughs> but um I'm, yeah, I can't, I can't not go, okay, yes, these pieces fell into place. Call it fate, call it whatever else you want to, uh, you know, whatever hard work went into it, but, you know, without luck and without 
the right pieces falling into place, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Well, you definitely got the show Life Changer from your initial conception to the Fantasia premiere. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, and that was just because I was already shooting and I had no idea. Like, for all I knew, Mark McCain was going to happen first. For all I knew, like, I didn't know this early on. Mm -hmm. For all I knew, Tripped was actually going to get me. Like, I just, I didn't know mm -hmm. until one got greenlit and that was yeah. kind of it. So, um, so um, you, you mentioned that um, before that um, Clapboard Jungle is going to be expanded into like a series. Could you tell how that's going to be different from the film version? Yeah, sure. We're already in post-production. We've already got a pilot edited and uh, mm -hmm. four episodes uh, assembled. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin Burke's working on the assemblies and then I'm going in and doing the fine tuning and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so the main difference is that it's not my story. It's, uh, it's a separate entity and it's an educationally focused one. So it's, mm -hmm. It's primarily talking heads with a tiny bit of like narration sewing it together and a few individual scenes that like come from the footage that I got. Uh, but largely it's every episode. We've got eight episodes. We don't know if there's going to be a second season. We, we're still finishing the first one, but every episode's a topic. So the pilot would be the history and how did we get here? Second episode would be uh, financing and development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's almost like a module film school in a box thing. Uh, and my, I, I'm, Right now I'm the narrator, maybe we change up the narrator, I don't know yet, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not about me anymore. The, that heart, that like emotional story, that's the movie. That's its own standalone thing. The series is, is uh, a different format. So what platform do you see the series appearing on? <laughs> well, uh, we're talking to a number right now mm -hmm. and we've got uh, people shopping it for educational. Um, it, mm -hmm. I can't really mention yet. Okay. Uh, I can't really say anything specific, but um, it'll be out there. People will be able to watch it it for cost-effective um, ways, <laughs> I guess would be the way to put that. Cheaper than film school, anyway. Yeah. yeah. I'm well, not so, saying that you shouldn't go to film school, but still. Well, I've been to film school. Yeah, just, that's a, a different conversation. A decade ago. It's a different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, well, I, have to, I have to end with the question about the current times and like yeah. how it added a whole new set of challenges for uh, filmmakers and mm -hmm. um, what you think is going to come from the pandemic is, and is the film industry ever actually going to fully recover? I don't have a crystal ball and I can't see the future. Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, I do know that film, the, the medium of film, the visual storytelling is not going anywhere as long as there's electricity and gear to use to make it. Mm -hmm. it's, no, it's going nowhere but is going to change a lot between now and five years from now. And it was going to do that whether there was a pandemic or not. But I think a lot of things like the popularity of digital streaming and, and uh, you know, SVOD platforms and um, theatrical windows closing and stuff like that. Virtual film might, festivals. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what might have been a, a five to 10 year process has now been shortened a lot. So I think we're going to see a lot more hybrid virtual stuff. Um, and I have no idea the state of the, the theater uh, environment, actually going to see a movie in theaters uh, mm -hmm. for now, because I personally, uh, I'm not going to get into that. But yeah. the point <laughs> is, is that on, on like a moral level, there's even the question of like, should you even be producing stuff right now, given mm -hmm. where you're producing and what the state of the cases are and all this mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, and I look at that, like Sarah Jones died on those train tracks and it's almost like everyone producing right now, if they're in an active zone of infection, are producing on metaphorical train tracks and eventually a train's going to hit a production. And uh, so there's definitely, there's big questions right now. We're going to see how it all pans out. I can't predict the future, but I do know things are going to be really rocky and really messed up for a while. And you just have to weather it with that change or, or, or not. <laughs> as sad as that is. That's, uh, that's a pretty negative note, note to end. Okay. Look, so, let's put it this way. Okay. If you can figure out a way to develop a niche that allows you to continue producing, even if it's for zero budget, you should be doing that right now because there's no guarantee you're gonna have a support structure in a year's time enough to get bigger projects made. So just focus on whatever you're able to do and uh, hope, hope for the best. <laughs>